Soren Kierkegaard, Chapter 2. Outward confusion and prophetic clarity were, indeed, the setting of Kierkegaard's entire life. Soren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, was the youngest child of a large family. His father, Pedersen, Michael Kierkegaard, was 56 when Soren was born, and his mother, 45. The father was a prosperous merchant, and the atmosphere of the home was one of comfort, strictest devotion to church and religion, and melancholy gloom. Michael Kierkegaard had grown up among the poor peasants of the Jutland Heath. There, Moravian preachers had so deeply stirred up the people by a religious revival that even children labored under a sense of sin and wished they had never been born. Week after week, thunderous sermons of damnation had been showering upon the peasants to shock them into virtue and frightening them into heaven. The vocabulary of these dark hours had engraved itself deeply upon the mind of young Michael. It is no wonder that after learning of the, quote, sacred wounds and holy blood, close quote, quote, hell being paved with the foreheads of sinful parsons, close quote, and youth, quote, being the children of Satan himself, close quote, that one day when he was herding the sheep, Michael cursed this terrible God of wrath who would allow no sunshine and joy in his young life. This curse spread an even greater darkness over his life. He never forgave himself such blasphemy, and there was scarcely a smile on his face from that moment until his death at the age of 82. Young, young Soren was present at the interminable discussion his father held with his neighbors. Father Michael had not only a successful business was not only a successful businessman, but also an intelligent reader of theological books. His stern methods of education kept the children indoors. Soren underwent the first exercises of his fertile imagination in extensive indoor, quote, excursions, close quote, in the living room, where father and son marched up and down, acting as though they were meeting acquaintances in the street describing fictitious houses, trees, and people, lowering their voices as if the rattle of passing carriages had drowned them out, or commenting upon the produce of an imagined fruit market. The world of sin and guilt was of such reality to Soren that he wrote later, quote, I have been from childhood on in the grip of an overpowering melancholy. My soul Joy being, as far as I can remember, that nobody could discover how unhappy I felt myself to be. I have never really been a man, even less a child or youth." Close quote. Several times his father took him to the sermons of the famous Bishop Meinster. There was no doubt that the salvation of his soul was the most important concern in Soren's thinking and conversation. As the purity of his soul became his most serious endeavor in later life. For years, his father's memory was fused with God's own image. And the old man's later confession of sexual excesses, the great, the quote, great earthquake, close quote, 1835, not only shocked Soren out of reverence for his earthly father, but also disrupted his devotion to his divine father. He was deeply ashamed of his father, whom he thought he must henceforth approach, quote, backwards with his face turned away so as not to see his disgrace, close quote, just as Noah's sons had approached their drunken and naked father. The curse of sin seemed to hang over the old man and his family. Only the older son, Peter Christensen, Christian, and Soren, the youngest of his children, survived. Michael's wife, Soren's mother, had been his servant before she became his second wife, and she remained of somewhat impersonable, shadow-like figure about whom Soren remained almost eternally silent. As a university student, Soren devoted himself at work at first to theology, but soon turned to the study of literature and philosophy. 
He lived the life of a bohemian intellectual and in the style of contemporaries extolled man's wit and reasoning power as the most fitting weapons for life. Since he had no financial worries, life did not seem bad after all. And young Soren did not mind accumulating a rather considerable debt which his father had to pay. The great change came when he broke his engagement to Regine Olsen, his attractive and lovely fiance, who, quote, was as light as a bird and as bold as a thought, close quote. He had met her when she was only 15, and after a two years engagement in 1841, he sent the engagement ring back to the disconsolate Regine with the following words, quote, in the Orient, it means death to receive a silken cord. But in this case, to mail the ring is likely to mean death for the sender." Close quote. There were many mysteries about this step. Because he had missed the warmth of motherly love, did he need the virgin mother image of this queen, Regina, parentheses, whom he continued to adore? Was celibacy one of the indispensable vows of his unordained ministry, itself a rejection of Luther's abolition of it? Did he consider Regine too light-hearted and happy a woman incapable of bearing his melancholy? Might it be, might it have been that his pro poetic soul could no longer face reality and join Eros? and agape in matrimony. Was marriage too convenient, a middle-class solution? The fact that he had loved Regina, Regine Olsen from the first day on as a poetic reflection of his memory and his loving mirage rather than as a real being may have rendered him incapable of marriage. As soon as his analysis, as soon as his analysis suspects Although Soren thought himself erotic to an extraordinary degree, was a sexual sin of earlier years his, quote, thorn in the flesh, close quote, of which he spoke repeatedly? Or was the breaking of his engagement perhaps one of his, quote, acts of vengeance, close quote, upon society and himself, of which he liked to write? He whose conscience made him feel always in the wrong before God may have acted wrongly even towards his fiancée. He never ceased to love her, and her subsequent engagement and marriage to Fritz Schlegel caused him severe depression. We may have, we have many answers to these questions, but the psychoanalysts, historians, and students of human nature seem unable to unveil the mystery of Soren Kierkegaard's private life. Even he himself, while taking great pains to let the mystery remain as it was, seemed puzzled. And the safest conclusion may be that the life of the spirit was to him the all-dominating concern to which everything else must be sacrificed. He felt called upon to do the, quote, extraordinary thing, close quote. But as a writer and Christian, his inability to follow his heart's longings added to the painful memories of his penitent, of this penitent sinner. The tragic interlude, which had followed by three years, his sudden awakening to God's nearness in an experience of, quote, indescribable joy, close quote, 1838. His pinpoint existence as a solitary seeker of truth the many open or veiled confessions in his writings and the tragedy of having to endure the hostility of the public will always be fertile ground for the exploration of biographers and psychologists. The mystery of his genius may remain impenetrable to others. His destiny was equally inexplicable, inexplicable to himself. In his diaries, he calls himself a Janus, whose one face laughs while the other one weeps. As a young man of 25, he wrote, quote, I too have both the tragic and the comic in me. I am witty and the people laugh.
but I cry, close quote. A year earlier, his diary had spoken of practicing, quote, vengeance upon the world, close quote, by acting gaily and consoling others, but hiding his own anxiety, hoping that, quote, if I can continue with this to my last day in life, I shall have had my revenge, close quote. He experienced indeed an oceanic feeling of anxiety, which modern depth psychology calls a sense of unrelieved suspense. An entry into his diary dated 1839 reads, quote, when I am alone in my kayak like a Greenlander on the world's immense ocean, as much above the water as underneath and always in God's hands, then it does occur to me to harpoon, harpoon a sea monster or some good occasion. But I don't have the skill to do so, close quote. He was no Captain Ahab to attack Moby Dick, the white whale representing evil. His spiritual abode was the same melancholy that had haunted his father. Quote, what the English say of their home, I have to say about my sadness. My sadness is my castle, 1839. 